Hi, my name is Michael Cullen for Film Sound Tutorials, and today I'm going to make a short video talking about the differences between mixing 5.1 surround sound versus stereo. And so this is a very common question that I get here on YouTube, and I just wanted to make a video to explain it in depth. And before I begin, just want to say a big thanks again to all the support and the great questions that I get on YouTube. I try to answer them as quick as possible, and it's great to see that the videos are helping people out. And if you're looking for more information, you can always check out my website at soundtuts.com, where there's a whole bunch of other helpful links and sample projects that you can also check out as well to become a better sound designer and mixer. All right, so let's begin. So before watching this video, I assume that you've already watched our 18 videos of the tutorial series that talks about the entire process of a post sound workflow. But if you remember from that tutorial series, the entire film was mixed in stereo. And I purposely made that whole tutorial series in stereo because most people only have a stereo mixing setup and most short films, indie films, commercials are still made in stereo. So it's an important thing to know. However, once you start working on larger projects and larger budget feature films, then you will need to know how to mix in 5.1 surround, 7.1, 9.1, or the new 3D systems like Dolby Atmos. And so when I first made Murphy's Law, because I knew it was going to show in a large theater, I first mixed it in 5.1, and then I remixed it in stereo for the tutorial series. So here I now have my 5.1 session that I originally worked on, and I'm going to talk about how Pro Tools is set up differently within all the different families between the 5.1 mix and the stereo mix. And in this video, I'm only going to be talking about mixing and panning because the organization of the session is very similar to how it's set up in stereo. So if you have any questions about the organization, feel free to check out the previous videos. All right, so here's our 5.1 session. And as you can see, I still have my dialogue family organized just like I did before, where we have the dialogue, we have our FUTS track, our ADR, and our group tracks. And really the only difference here between the stereo mix is how the panning looks like in 5.1. So if you open up the panning window, you'll see our 5.1 panner, which looks a little bit different than our stereo panner. And when I'm looking at this, the easy way to visualize using this panner is to imagine that you're looking at a bird's eye view of a movie theater. So the very top of this panner would be the front or where the screen is on the movie theater. And then at the bottom of this panner is the back of the theater. And then when you want to pan the sound, you move the little green ball around the movie theater. So just as a little refresher, in 5.1 surround, that means that you have a minimum of six different speakers. And those speakers are the left speaker, the center speaker, the right speaker, the left surround, the right surround, and then the LFE or the subwoofer speaker. And so if I wanted to pan my dialogue to the left, I could put this into touch mode. I could move the little red ball to the left and it would record that automation to the left-hand side. If you think about it, give some free time, pick up some hobbies. Uh... And of course, we could double check when we go to our panning and we look at the front position panning that I pan the dialogue to the left-hand side. Now, of course, just like in stereo, there are a whole bunch of different conventions on where you should pan the different families. And for dialogue, just like we did in stereo, normally 90% of the time, the dialogue is only panned to the very center of the screen. And again, that's because when you have a large theater, you don't wanna pan it all the way to the left or all the way to the right, because then the people on the opposite side of the theater wouldn't be able to hear the dialogue as clearly, and the dialogue is what tells the story of the film, so that's pretty important, and we want the entire audience to hear that. Now, of course, there are a couple moments when you might want to pan the dialogue. For example, as you can remember here, where we had our split screen with Murphy and the puppet, where Murphy is on the right side of the screen and the puppet is on the left side of the screen, and as you can see here, that's exactly what I did. And then if you go down to the Chiefs track down here on ADR4, that the Chief 
is panned all the way to the left. But like I said, generally for dialogue, it's panned in the center, and that's about it. Now let's move down in our session. Like I said, the ADR can be panned if needed. And then we get down to our group tracks. And so if you remember for our group tracks, they're normally used for the different crowds that forms when Murphy's out in the field. And they provide some nice little walla or background dialogue to kind of fill out the scene. And so for my crowd sounds, because I wanted the audience to feel like they were enveloped in the scene, I used the surround sound panning to make it feel like the audience is right there in the middle of the crowd. So for example, at the end of the film, where we have the crowd and they're hanging around the bank, then I have a stereo track that's panned to the front left and front right, just like normal. But I also have another stereo walla track that's panned to the back left and back right. So because of this, now the audience actually feels like they're in the middle of this crowd. And so that's one way that you can use surround sound audio to better tell the story, which is of course what we're trying to do with the audio. Great, so that kind of explains how I pan the dialogue family. Now let's go down to our Foley tracks. So here's my Foley tracks. And for Foley, we don't pan this any differently than we would in stereo. So Foley sound effects generally match the movement of the characters on screen. And since the screen is in the front of the theater, then it normally doesn't make sense that we want to pan the Foley track to the back of the audience. And so for Foley tracks, we might pan them left and right, but generally for Foley tracks, we never go back to the back of the theater. Great, so now we're moving on to our sound effects tracks. Now the sound effects is where you can have the most fun when you're panning in 5-1 surround. So generally for the sound effects, again, you want to use them to match the action on screen. You want to pan them so that they follow the character's movements, but then you can also do additional stuff that then helps better tell the story. So like a good example of that in Murphy's Law is here when Murphy first comes on to the scene. We added some sound effects of the police cars coming in. We added a helicopter and we actually have another helicopter here. And what I did for the helicopter was pan it so that it sounded like it was circling, hovering on top of the scene. And so let me kind of show you what that looks like. So if I open up my panning window, Here's the uh, sound effect that I panned. And of course, you're not gonna hear the full effect of this panning, because this video is in stereo. But when you look at the panning, you can kind of imagine how the sound effect goes around the theater. And so you can see how I use the panning to go in between the front speakers and the back speakers. So that's a good example on how you can use panning and surround sound to make the audience really feel like they're part of the scene. And unless you're working on a space movie like Gravity, where things are moving around the audience at all times, Generally, again, it's better to keep things panned up in the front of the screen so that it's not too distracting for the audience when they hear things happening behind them. Another fun thing that you can do with sound effects is that you can send sound effects straight to the subwoofer or the LFE. So here in my template, I have a sound effect LFE track. And if you open up the 5.1 panner, here I have the LFE enabled. Now, when you are adding sound effects to the LFE, you wanna be pretty judicious on what you send to the subwoofer. Because if you use the subwoofer often, then your mix is gonna sound really muddy, and then every subsequent sound effect won't have as much punch or impact because you're using it so often. So it's best to only send sound effects to the LFE for the most important moments in the film. So as you can see here, my LFE track is pretty sparse and I only have it when major things happen in the film. And so when you're in the movie theater and then the subwoofer finally engages, then it really makes the audience feel like this is a big moment in the film. All right, so now moving down to our background tracks. 
As you can see, again, this looks pretty familiar, but now I have a few more tracks because I have more speakers that I need to fill. And since we have more speakers in 5.1 Surround, we have to have more background tracks to fill all of those speakers. So for the backgrounds, for the mono track, of course, I just panned it to the middle. And then for the first two stereo background tracks, I pan them to the front left and front right. But then for the next two, I pan them to the left surround and the right surround. So again, just like before, I'm adding audio to the surround speakers to make the audience feel like they're really enveloped in the scene. Again though, you don't wanna add anything that's too distracting in those back surrounds because then it'll draw the audience's attention away from the screen, which is not what we want. And so you can see I did that for the BGAs and then I did the same thing for the BGBs. And normally two stereo tracks for the front and two stereo tracks for the back is the minimum. I've seen people do four and four. It depends how much audio you really want in those backgrounds, but I would say that you'd have to do at least two for the front and back as a minimum. Great, so moving on. Now we're on to our music tracks. So if you remember in our music tutorial that I mixed the music in 5.1 with the composer together, and he had already actually panned most of the instruments how he wanted it beforehand. So I really didn't do too much for panning since it was already pretty much pre-mixed. However, I did do some different things in 5.1 surround than I would do in stereo because of the added speakers. So one thing that is different in 5.1 surround is that I can add the bass instruments to the LFE subwoofer track. Now just a word of caution, there are different opinions on if you should do this or not do this. Some people believe that you should only use the LFE for sound effects, you should not use it for music, because again, you don't wanna muddy up your subwoofer track. But for here, for the electric bass, you can see that I added just a tad to the subwoofer to again give the electric bass a little more oomph, and then I did it for the drums as well. And then another cool thing that you can do in 5 Once Around is that you can actually bring your music off of the screen. So as you probably know from our panning tutorial that a lot of the audio normally sits in the middle of the screen. You have your dialogue in the middle of the screen, you have your sound effects, you have your Foley that's normally kind of in the middle or pan left side of the screen. So if you have so much audio going on at a time, things become less clear because they're all playing through the same speakers. So one way that you can make your mix more clear is by bringing things off of the screen and doing that with music tracks is a good way to do that. So for example, when I went to pan my string instruments, I actually pan them to the left and right, but then I brought them off of the screen and towards the back of the audience. And so what this does is again gives us more room for everything else in our mix in the center channels. So another good way that you can clean up your mix is by default Pro Tools will automatically pan everything to fill into that center speaker as well. And here I purposely took that out so that again we're leaving space for the dialogue in the center channel and then the music just comes out from the other speakers instead. And so you can see I did that for my brass instruments. I pulled it out a bit, and I also turned it down for my synth instrument as well. Now you might be wondering though, since the music was made in stereo, how do we make this music be surround sound? And so since I was mixing this with the composer, we decided to pan only a few instruments to the surround sound speakers. And so how we did that is we set up a new aux track called MX Back or the Music Back. We panned it to the left surround and the right surround, of course took out the center. And then we bust the instruments that we wanted in the surrounds to that aux track. So for example, we wanted the strings to also play from the back surround. And we also wanted the synth instrument to also play from the back surrounds. So now not only is our strings playing from the front speakers, but they're also being routed to the back speakers as well. And then you can see I added a little delay of adding 10 milliseconds of delay to this back aux track so that the audio would play always a little bit out of sync from the front, 
which then gave the mix a little more width and a little more space. And just a note about delays, if you do something like this on your surrounds, make sure that your delay isn't less than 10 milliseconds, otherwise you're gonna start having phasing issues and comb filtering issues, and your mix won't sound as good. And along with the delay, I added a little reverb to add a little more space and depth to the music that was playing in the back of the theater. Great, so moving on, now we're on to our reverbs. And if you remember from the reverb tutorial, I like to split up my reverbs based on audio family. And as you can see here, I have a bunch of reverbs that's only for the dialogue. So I have a mono reverb if I needed it to just be in the center of the screen. I have a default stereo reverb if you want it to kind of ping pong. And then I added reverb for the different FUTS tracks that I have in my mix. So I have a reverb for all the police walkie talkies. I have a reverb for the bullhorn. I have a reverb for the TV. I have a reverb for the chief and the puppet. I have a reverb for when we had our ADR in the home. Reverb for the banks. Reverb for the crowds. And then I also added a 5-1 reverb, which I didn't use very often. But for example, when Murphy was talking to his dad and he was a ghost, then I used a 5-1 reverb to make his dad feel a little more otherworldly. And then I have a reverb for the sound effects that were sent to the back surround speakers. I have a 5-1 reverb for the sound effects that I only really use for the big moments in the film and when I wanted the sound effects to really fill up the whole movie theater. And then I have a reverb for the Foley to make the Foley sit a little bit better and a reverb for the music if I needed it. So even though I have a lot of speakers that I could add reverb to, I only added reverb to audio when it helped the audio better sit in the mix or when it helped better tell the story. So again, you wanna be really specific on when you add reverb to your mix. Great, so then moving on to our submasters. These should look pretty familiar. The only difference with them is that instead of being stereo aux tracks, they are now 5-1 surround sound aux tracks, and so they have six channels. But other than that, everything's set up the same way. I have my compressor, have a limiter, same thing as before. Great, so then moving down, we have our print tracks. And again, same thing as before, instead of being stereo print tracks or stereo stem tracks, they are now in 5.1. And in terms of mixing, it's the same process as in stereo, except now we're using a 5.1 lefts meter to measure our overall volume. So if you're mixing for the theater, you're looking for around negative 23, negative 24 lefts. If you're mixing for YouTube, that would be negative 14 lefts. However, if you are mixing something for YouTube, normally you mix it down to stereo first, and then you would mix that for negative 14 luffs. And then like I said previously, sometimes I'm asked to make a mix that would work for both theatrical and for YouTube. And so then I try to split the middle and I mix to around negative 18 luffs. So then the only difference between the stereo stem tracks and the 5.1 stem tracks is the order that Pro Tools shows the different speakers. So for stereo tracks, normally the first track is the left speaker and then the second track is the right speaker. But once you start working on larger mixes that contain multiple speakers in a multi-track print master, then the order of the speakers changes depending on where you're distributing the audio file. And when you're working with 5.1 surround, there's two main multi-track standards which dictate the order of the speakers within the track. So one common standard is called film order, which means that the speakers should appear in this following order, left, center, right, LS, RS, LFE, versus another film standard, it's called SMPTE standard, which is left, right, center, LFE, LS, RS. And generally, SMPTE is the preferred order when you're delivering tracks to different distributors. However, in Pro Tools, Pro Tools uses film order instead. So for example, when you look at our print master here down at the bottom, and then you split it into mono, instead of it being left, right, center, Pro Tools has it left, center, right, LS, RS, LFE. So here's what it looks like in film order versus if you're doing it in SMPTE order, it would be like 
this. So that's a really important thing to know if you're working in 5.1 is what's the final path order that your distributor is looking for because if you give it to them in the wrong order, then most of your tracks will be playing from the wrong speakers, which definitely does not sound good. So one way to prevent any confusion is that when you export your multi-channel tracks from Pro Tools, you export every track individually into separate mono files so that then when the distributor gets your audio files, they can put the audio files in the correct speaker order that they need. Great, so there you have it. So this was a quick overview of the differences between mixing in 5.1 surround versus stereo. And to recap, we talked about how the dialogue track is normally mixed to the center of the screen and then the group or the wall of tracks are normally panned to the left, right, and then also to the left surround and right surround. We talked about how the Foley is normally only panned to the left, center, and right. We talked about how the sound effects could mostly be in the left, center, and right. It could also go into the surround sound speakers to make the audience feel like they're more part of the action. For the backgrounds, every speaker except the LFE should have background sounds coming from it. And then for the music, we talked about how we could be really judicious in panning the music in the surround sound speakers to make the music feel larger than life. And then we talked about how we could use reverbs to make the mix feel bigger. And then how the submasters and the print master tracks are pretty much the same, except that they're multi-channel tracks instead of two tracks. And you have to pay attention in what order that the multi-track is set up. So if you have any questions, let me know. Thanks for watching. I'll see you later.